I have titled today's message, Break the Cycle. Break the Cycle. And we are going to unpack from God's Word on what He has to say out of a unique passage in Matthew chapter 26 around the topic of fear and anxiety. Now, I know this is a hot topic, but it is a hot topic that all of us deal with at varying degrees. In fact, God made you with emotions, and you know, fear and anxiety does have its place. It has a specific purpose, which we'll talk about. Um, Fast Company actually deployed a survey more recently to identify the top three fears that people have. About 60% said these top three kind of bubbled up. They were, they were polling employees and employers. And essentially, these are the three things that came up. And this is for 2023 now. This isn't dated. This is like right now. It's a current snapshot. The first was the economy and how it relates to people's personal finances. The second was the global events. It only takes about two seconds of scrolling on your newsfeed, try it this week if you don't believe me, to be like, whoa, there's a lot going on in our world. And so we have to really guard our hearts on all that we are allowing inside. There are some tragic events happening around our world to humankind, and that should move us because it because Jesus lives inside of us and he loves humanity. I think thirdly is domestic events. We have a lot going on right here at home and in our own communities. And you know, there are talks of crime on the rise and different things that, that really, uh, they, they do spark fear and anxiety in us. And so I came not to talk about that, but to come to tell you there is good news. There is good news because we know the one who holds the answers. And I might even submit to you, to some of you, to remind you today that the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, lives in you. And he thought so much of you to say, hey, I want to identify some areas so you can get further freedom, so you can go out into your assignments in places of work, in business, in government, in education. There's lots of entrepreneurs in our church. Everywhere you go, you are an assignment to be a light in the world around you. And a little bit of light, flashlight, goes a long way in a dark world. And so these are exciting times that are upon us because we know that we carry the light of Christ on the inside of us. So I want to do some equipping today. Is that okay with you? Awesome. Awesome. So the National Library of <clears throat> Medicine uh, called, they, they had an article called The Biology of Fear. So I think we have to start here before we can unpack this. The, <clears throat> the main function of fear and anxiety is to act as a signal for danger. Essentially, what it's doing is it's, it's triggering your fight or flight response. We've all experienced it. There's a good reason for it. It will help you survive <laughs> in situations such as your child runs out into, into the street. A mama don't think twice about going to get her baby, okay? So I need some adrenaline to kick in. You are driving the car on, let's say, the 495, and somebody is texting and driving. This is no judgment, just saying. 65, 75, 85 miles an hour, and they come over in your lane. You're probably going to have a little fight or flight kick in. Good, because that is going to save your life. So there are good purposes for this. The challenge is, is that a lot of times we can get triggered and live with chronic anxiety that can have, and fear at that matter, which is happening in our world. I would even go as far to say that we've got a pandemic of fear on our hands. And the reality is God has given us answers that we are going to unlock from his word. In fact, they, it actually has uh, effects on our physical, emotional state. Fear actually weakens your immune system. So people that, a lot of people can even be plagued with ulcers and different things. It has a lot of negative effects on the body, on the heart. It decreases fertility. It impairs long-term memory. Uh, it actually affects your ability to navigate and regulate normal human emotions. It has a lot of negative effects. But the Bible says, it actually has a lot to say about fear. In fact, it is, there are 365 times in the Bible that God's word says, do not fear. Interestingly enough, that's, that's one for every day of the Gregorian calendar, right? So it's kind of important. He's like, hey, you're human. So if you're breathing, last time I checked, check your neighbor, make sure they're still awake. You are going to battle this. And so we need to be equipped to handle it. In fact, 
there is a term and kind of this thought, this model that I want to introduce to you. And I was introduced to it about 10 years ago. And it is uh, by the name of Chester and Betsy Kleistra. They started a ministry called Restoring the Foundations. And it's all about a lot of inner healing and unpacking our yesterdays. And there is a cycle, which I believe we have a graphic we're going to put on the screen for you. But it's called Shame, Fear, and Control Cycle. And it is also called a stronghold. This is what uh, biblical terms we would call a stronghold. And strongholds are simply, they, they get cemented in our minds. And, and last week, like I said, Jeremy talked a lot about shame. And he actually mentioned something called the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, which a lot of psychologists use. But essentially, it's we've got to catch these thoughts that are running rampant in our heads, And we have to submit them to the lordship of Christ. Church, this is a warning signal. Just like our body says, hey, hey church, it's time to come higher. It's time to get God's perspective on a world that needs light. You hear what I'm saying? Today is the day. Today is the day that we could hear God calling us. Hey, I need you to get my perspective on the economy. I need you to get my perspective on what's happening in the world around me because my Bible says that God will work all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't promise us that hard things won't happen. It doesn't mean that there are not real fearful events. But what it does say is we have somewhere to go for peace. A great exchange is possible because of what, what Jesus has done. In fact, Isaiah 6, 20, excuse me, 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You know, the key is trust. A lot of times, I don't know about you, but you know, I get a little, I, I get a little anxious sometimes with God's ways because he's like, You know, I'm like, Jesus, you know, I need a plan, and I'd like it like yesterday. And he is really good at coming through at the 11th hour. Is there anybody who understands this, right? For a planner, this is like your worst nightmare, right? You're like, Jesus, uh, you already knew the future. Do you think you could have let me in a little bit earlier or sooner? But he's like, hey, I need you to learn to trust me. I need you to trust the words that I give you. And I need you to, instead of anxiety, I need you to fix your mind steadfast on what I am telling you. In fact, my oldest daughter, she has a pretty low threshold of pain like her mama. Now listen, I have heard that redheads don't do pain well, and I'm just here to testify this is true, okay? Uh, I have no problem saying I like some epidurals. So I didn't even say, I didn't, the first service didn't get that. So here's the reality. She is following in my footsteps in that, you know, she's kind of a little sensitive to pain. And so here we are uh, probably about a year ago and I had dropped some glass and we have this floor or we used to have this floor that shatters glass like into little shards. And she's walking through the kitchen and she steps on one and this little shard of glass gets really wedged at a weird angle in her foot. And so I take her to the doctor. The doctor's like, hey, you have two options. We can either dig this thing out. And I'm like, yeah, that ain't going to work. You know, this, this girl does not like pain. <laughs> like, or you can let her body naturally fight, and it's going to work the foreign object out of her body naturally. And so, you know, of course, Hannah's like, yeah, Lamal, I'll just wait. It doesn't really hurt too bad right now. So she's kind of wobbling out. Now, it was during soccer season. So when she put her cleats on and she went running on the field, she literally almost buckled in pain because of the angle in which she was running. It hit that shard of glass in just the right way. Fear, anxiety and fear can trigger us like that. We think we're fine. We're good. We're doing our thing, right? God, I've, I've got it all under control. And then something triggers you. And we would be wise to take a stop and say, God, what, what is that? We've got to learn to be curious. In fact, my dear friend, Dr. Julie Ream says, God does not reveal what he doesn't want to heal. God is not looking to reveal that to give you more pain. Although for a moment, when you got to dig glass out of your feet, come on, who knows, that hurts. It might take a moment, but man, once it's out, you will feel relief. A lot of times, church, our soul is like that. We're running and gunning so hard, and then we're like, ah, ah. What is that? What happened? And those moments are the moments that we have to take it to, we, we have to get really good at being vulnerable with God. In fact, John 8, 36 promises, so if the Son sets you free, you are free in 
indeed. Now, I wish I could tell you, man, I gave my heart to Jesus. I got no issues. Woo! Nah, that's not how it works. Sometimes there's instantaneous healing moments and stuff, but most of the time it's a journey of peeling back the onion layers. And that is the process of getting true freedom. It's available to us. In fact, I want to share three antidotes with you today from Matthew 26. In fact, this story is actually recorded three or four times in the Gospel of Matthew. I want you to read with me on the screens. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume which she poured on his head as he reclined at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant, and they asked, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price, and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus asked, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful deed to me. The poor will always, you will always have among you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this perfume on me, she has prepared my body for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached, hello, February 12th, 2023, right here in Bethesda, Maryland. You don't even know why you're here. What she has done will always be told in memory of her. Now, I want to set this up because most scholars do believe this Mary to be the sister of both Martha and Lazarus. Now, Martha, I don't know, maybe, maybe you, you are familiar, maybe you're not, but Martha was an older sister, and she had already tattled on Jesus a couple times. She's like, she's like, look, she was the one that was making all the preparation. She was the one with a gift of hospitality, even if it drove her crazy. And she was like, Jesus, tell my sister to help me, <laughs> right? So, so Mary was kind of like, this, this was kind of a norm for her in this relationship. And of course, we know Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus and you know, there, there, were, there were lots of history here. And Mary decides to take a dowry, the most important gift. In fact, it used to be that women would get this alabaster box, which is precious stone, and then it's filled with perfume that actually could cost up to a year's wages, right? I mean, this is nicer than Gucci. Come on. Okay, this is some nice perfume that she's about to lay at the feet of Jesus, and she is in this moment. She's in this moment. And, and I believe what Mary had to do in this moment, maybe perhaps she's had a little bit, maybe there's some, even some shame. I mean, we, we, read, we read these stories as if like they're extra biblical superheroes, right? Nah, these are people just like you and me. And they are very human. And so I love the chosen because they've done that. They've kind of, the chosen, if, no, if none of you have seen it, they're literally putting Jesus's life in film. And I love it because, you know, they're adding a little drama, right? That, that is probably pretty normal because we read these as if they're super spiritual. No, these are people like you and me with the same emotions, the same soul, spirit hurts, wounds that maybe have gone unattended uh, to. So we can kind of put ourselves in her shoes for just a moment. I wonder... I wonder if maybe in the back of her mind as she decides to approach Jesus when he's hanging with his boys, this is before Jesus actually says like, hey, um, I actually don't have a problem with women hanging out with me. And actually, um, in fact, I'm, a lot of them, I'm going to call them to leadership. Okay, so I, I'm just telling you, in, in the natural, we'd probably have some anxiety. She's stepping out in a day before it's actually like okay to do that. So she's got some natural anxiety, some natural fear of, like, oh, man, I don't know exactly what's going to happen here. But you know what? I do trust that man. That man's in the, he's in the room. I wonder if in the back of her mind she's thinking, man, I, my sister, she's going to be like, there's Mary doing it again. <laughs> I'm in here washing the dishes, <laughs> serving all these people. She needs to be in here. Nah, She's probably hearing a record player with some things that she had picked up maybe from childhood, just like you and me. And in this moment, she chooses vulnerability. Now, if you missed last week, I know I've said it, but there's a whole entire message on vulnerability that Jeremy did last week. Florence Nightingale says, how very little can be done under a spirit of fear. So what do we need to do to start breaking the cycle of shame and fear and control? What do we need to do 
to do that? Well, I would submit to you the first step is we have to choose to be vulnerable with our anxieties and fears. Yeah, I got them, just like you. We both do. So let's just like cut to the chase. We have them. Second Timothy 1 7 says, For God has not given me a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Step number one, if you're going to be vulnerable, is you are going to need to be honest with yourself. Sometimes some of us are so bound up that we don't want to admit that we deal with anxiety and fear in the private of your own mind. That is the first step, is to be vulnerable. Be vulnerable. Acknowledge it. Romans 8.1 gives us confidence that we can do this. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means, let me help you, come as you are. In fact, I can do my best work when you are in a weak place. Don't you love Jesus? He's like, my power is perfected in your weakness. I don't know about you, but I don't love being like, yeah, this is, this is my weak spot. Isn't it awesome? None of us like doing that. That is, that is anxiety provoking. But can I tell you, man, when we begin to get some kingdom thinking, he's like, no, nah, all the more I will boast in my weakness because I know that Jesus does his best work when I, am, when I am allowing the cross of Jesus Christ to be my guide. When I can be weak so that he can be strong because it's not about me. It's not about my performance. It's about who he is. So that all the onlookers, man, that's Jesus. I know, I know her. I know him. I know, I used to know who they were. I know what Jesus has done in their lives. And we become living testimonies of the wonder working power of God. Hebrews 4.16 we have this confidence. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy. I don't know about you, but I need a lot of mercy in my life. A lot of mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Even the great King David, a man after God's own heart, he is a king. When anxiety was great within me, my consolation brought me joy. He was, he was a worshiper. Now, David knew how to, I mean, he did some crazy stuff. Like, he danced before Jesus, like, without clothes. I don't recommend that. Um, but, you know, like, he, he, he got crazy. He was like, man, here I am. Here I am, God. I am offering you my humanity. Psalms 94, 19. And we know he didn't have a clean record, and neither do you or me. This is our God. The second thing, the second step we're going to need to do if we're going to be vulnerable is we have to take the mask off. If you have been to Catalyst at least once, I promise, I, don't, I think we actually say that every message, don't we, Pastor New? Every message, take your mask off. Why? Because we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. And what we know in James 5.16, therefore confess your sins one to another and you will be, come on, you know it, healed. Come on, one more time. You will be healed. You'll be healed. So first, you got to confess it to the one who actually has the power to make a great exchange. That's Jesus. But then you got to take your mask with other people. Oh, Jeremy and I hear it all the time. Man, that felt good to, to get that off my chest. Well, yeah, you did, because you were actually walking out the word. And the word works. The word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to get into where the shards of glass are and be like, I got more for you, baby. I got more. But you got to be vulnerable. You got to be vulnerable. The third thing you need to do, the third step, is actually now that we've decided to be vulnerable, take the mask off, we are now going to begin to identify. This is where the hard work comes in. We're going to begin to identify the lies that we have believed about ourselves that are causing the anxiety and the fear. Maybe the lies that you've believed about God. Maybe perhaps for some of you, you don't want to, to be vulnerable with God because you actually don't have a right, accurate perspective of who he is. And you have believed some lies that he's some distant God that you have to be cleaned up and holy for. No, God, th this, is, this is why he sent his son, Jesus. He says, come as you are. I mean, he can handle our mess. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? I have a challenge for you this week. I want you to ask God. I would write, if you're not a note taker, write this down, okay? I don't have to talk to the note takers. You're already done it. Father, is there a lie that I am believing about myself, about you, or this circumstance or situation? 
And then once you identify it and you're like, whoa, that was in there. Yeah, that was the shard of glass wedged in your soul. I want you to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for believing that about myself because I know that I am your masterpiece. Forgive me for believing that about your character. Forgive me for believing that you actually weren't going to come through for me. Pastor New just said that. He, he, he felt the Spirit of God speak to him in the first service. And, and he said, man, forgive me for not believing you at your word. And then we're going to break agreement with that lie. That is not the truth. And then we're going to replace it with God's truth. How do we know God's truth? Man, it's in the word of God. And then as you tune your ear to hear the truth, you, because I believe, church, Jer Jeremy and I, as a part of this church, one of, when we birthed this church, the heartbeat was, man, if we could be a catalyst, no pun intended, <laughs> so that people could hear the voice of God, that could really make a difference. Because when you hear the voice of your father, there is nothing that can stand in your way. Because you are convinced of your identity. Identity, you gotta hear it from the father for yourself. If you're like, man, how do I do that? Man, join one of our Faith in Life courses. Pull any, any leader or catalyst aside. We are committed to helping you figure that out. Because he's speaking. It just takes a little training and practice so you can recognize it, that's all. So this week, some of you, your next step is book a counseling appointment, like, like today. Some of you, it's, man, talk to a spiritual mentor, a pastor, a catalyst. That's what we're here. Talk to somebody. Take, it, take the mask off so that you can say, like, man, that felt so great to get that off my chest. It really, it really wasn't actually that big of a deal. And you know what you do? You, you almost like, it, it's kind of like laughing at the spirit of fear that, dis, that kept you from holding back. Because the spirit of fear says, what are they going to think? They're going to judge you. And when you receive the opposite, you realize you have been lied to. You have been lied to. And we know who the father, we know, we know what the Bible says. Who is the father of lies? The enemy. And you have one. John 10, 10 says that the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is what he does. Why does he do that? Because you reflect your father's image. Isn't that awesome? You just became a target. <laughs> but can I tell you, the father's like, hey, we'll get to this in a minute. Don't worry about those fiery darts. Don't worry. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. So you keep walking, baby. You keep walking. Second antidote is to fix your eyes on Jesus. If we are going to reverse engineer the shame, fear, and control cycle, then we're gonna have to get vulnerable. And then, instead of fear, we are actually gonna have to flip it and we're gonna have to have some faith. Do you see, Mary saw Jesus and she was like, look, now I know that my brothers, they are, you know, she is risking the fear of rejection, she is risking the fear of judgment, and she doesn't even, she's like, nah, 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 I'm gonna fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, Hebrews says, I'm gonna keep on walking. Webster defines faith, complete trust and confidence in someone or something. The quickest way to be riddled with anxiety is to trust in yourself, and a lot of us do. Rather than seeking God for the answer first, we work ourselves into a tizzy. <laughs> I'm talking to some holy people. Y'all are like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you are talking about. I know a little something about this. Rather than, yeah, you know what? Absolutely. There are two schools of thought. Some are like, man, pray all the time, you know, and do nothing. And then there's, here's, here's the philosophy I adhere to is pray and do it and be excellent. Offer your excellence without striving and let, watch God work. Watch him work. Because the reality is that there are some things, this word of God, he has told us to do. If you don't do those, then, and you're over here saying, well, it doesn't work. Well, you didn't do them. Do what the word says and watch it work because it works. Y'all following me? Do what you can do so God can do what he can do. And the moment you start feeling anxiety about the big problem or situation that you are facing right now, I want you to ask yourself a question. Do I think this actually is all on me? Because that's a quick way to be anxious in a hurry. Or am I going to just choose? Rather, I'm going to do what I can do, and then I'm going to trust my Father with the rest. 
And you will watch. Here's the thing. When you invite him into the process, my Bible says that Jesus is perfect love. And perfect love drives out fear. It has to go. It has to go. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Now, that's the problem, right? The evidence of things unseen is where I get all uptight. Do I have anybody that will be honest with me? It's, it's in the waiting. It's in the waiting to watch God move. It's in the waiting, and that is why in the waiting it is so important that we hear the voice of God, and then we can be like, it's already settled. It's already settled. I am all off my notes, y'all. <laughs> Psalm 1611 says, because he has made known to us the path of life, and he will fill us with joy in his presence. And this is where the great exchange happens, is that we can have peace instead of anxiety. We can have perfect peace. We can have shalom, shalom, right? We can have the perfect peace, the perfect peace instead of a spirit of fear in our lives. What if we, instead of focusing on the what ifs, because we're all really good at that. We're really good like, but God, what if you don't show up? Don't you think I have to have like a plan B and a C and a D? Not, no, 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 nope. What if we turn that around and we begin to train ourselves? What if God actually does show up? What if that job that you thought you were not qualified for, what if you step out and apply? And he, in your weakness, he shows himself strong. What if that school that you didn't think you were good enough to get in, what if God shows up and that's, and he, if he's, he's urged you to go in that direction and you just put the application in and you go for it? What if God doesn't show up? You know, I've been praying for my spouse forever. What if God's taken a little extra time because he loves you so much and he's given you a tailor-made version that has less issues? And all the married people said, come on. If you're waiting, let Jesus work on you, baby. Get the shards of glass out. It's going to be a lot smoother because marriage is not smooth all the time. But if you can deal with some of your issues now, and married people, we are not excused. We need to deal with our issues so we can have some peace in our home. <laughs> What if, what if that relationship ends, Jesus, I'll fall apart? What if he's saving you for the rest of your life? What if that job door closes? Well, what if he has a custom-made, tailor-fit assignment that no one else can fill but you? You know, I remember the birth of our firstborn, Hannah. <sighs> Oh, Hannah. And I remember I had wrestled in private. God, like, I really feel like I'm on assignment at this particular nonprofit I was working at. And I feel like I'm called, but I'm also, you're calling me to motherhood. And I want to say yes, and I want to do it all. And, and I want to be a great wife, and I want to be a great mom, and I want to be a great employer. And, and, and by the way, on maternity leave, they opened up a new position for me that was a definite promotion, which, by the way, doesn't happen. So I knew that the hand of God was on this. But if I'm honest, I was getting all anxious trying to figure it out. It's hard enough to be a first-time parent. I was working it out, and I, I just felt led to take a walk. So I took a walk around the block and quieted my soul. There's a lot of value in just be still and know that I am God. Especially when you feel real anxious, you, you just need to time out, time out. I do it to my children all the time. I'm like, time out, y'all, sit down. It's a lot going on right now. Sometimes you gotta do that to yourself. It happened to me just recently. Time out. I need to be still before the Lord and I need to hear him for direction because I can't do this on my own. And neither can you. As I walked around the block, I heard just the spirit of God inside. He said, <laughs> I love this. I will make a way where there is no way. Well, that sounds real spiritual, Jesus, but are you going to give me some details? How are we going to work this out? Like, I need a little bit, of, I need a little bit more. Now, Christina, I will make a way where there is no way. 
Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. A week later, a friend gives us a call, and she was between jobs, and she said, I, in prayer, I just keep, I keep feeling like I'm supposed to offer to be a nanny for six months for you guys. I could not have picked a better person for that season of our lives. He's like, don't worry, kids. I, I feed the birds. I, I clothe the fields. And you worry about everything. Can you just trust me? Can you just trust me? Some of you are facing some really big decisions and really big life changes. Some of you are facing some situations where you're ready to throw the towel in in your marriage. Some of you are ready to walk away from the job that God told you to go to, but it's getting too hard. Can I remind you, church, take a time out. It's worth your soul. He values the birds of the air. He didn't create you as a human doing to be trying to figure it out all by yourself in a tailspin, in a whirlwind. You know, want to know why I'm so passionate about this? Because I'm really good at tailspins. <laughs> and in my weakness, he is strong. One word, one word changes everything. One word. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. When you are in the tailspin, of caught up in fear and anxiety, I need you to stop, call a timeout. Jesus, come. Perfect fear, dry, or perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love, invite him into the conversation. What are you afraid of? What problems are you facing right now? Do it this week. This week, not next week. Don't put it off for another day because you can't run around anymore with shards in your feet. It's time to go. It's time to go. Antidote number three, surrender control. In verse 10 and 13, we see Jesus is standing up for Mary. Why are you bothering this woman? And Jesus corrects the lenses in which they are, are viewing her because, you know, they're, they're coming at it with a lens of lack. This is the same Jesus, y'all, that opened the fish of a mouth and took a coin out. I don't think he has a money problem. And then he went over here and they're like, Jesus, all these people, we don't have enough money to go buy, you know, food for all these 5,000 plus people. And he's like, hey, just give me those fish and loaves and poof, done. These moments that we feel lack, and you feel the spirit of fear encroaching around you, you need to remind yourself who your daddy is. You need to remind yourself, I refuse to have lenses of fear. I am going to lock in Fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, and he will come through for you. He will come through for you. You know the ironic thing about this whole situation is that Judas, of all people, he's like, Jesus, do you know that this perfume is worth a year's wages and she just wasted it at your feet? He said, mm-mm. By the way, G Judas later sells Jesus for less than what that perfume cost. Let that sit with you for a little bit. Anytime you hear or sense a, an accusing spirit, you better believe that the enemy is lurking around because our Father's voice is not accusing. His loving kindness leads us to repentance. Loving kindness. And before you think, man, I knew, I knew Aunt Jean, she was mean. Before you start naming people. <laughs> Y'all get that in a minute. You have to separate the spirit from the person. Because here's what my Bible says. That we were each formed in our mother's womb. We were knit together on perfect with perfect, per perfect, perfectly us. He was at the inception of who we are, and there is nothing wrong with you. There are some of you in here that you have believed that there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. 
You are God's masterpiece to be put on display in all your weakness so that he gets the glory. And there's some of you, when, when, when you start to hear those accusing spirits, because oftentimes they come through people, hello, Judas is talking, but, but Jesus still let him hang out. He loved the person. He loves the people. You gotta separate the spirit from the person. Y'all hear me, you with me? Jesus, God gave his son Jesus to die for people. It's not a people problem. It's a spirit of fear problem. And we have to deal with it in the spirit. In fact, John 4, 24 said, God is spirit, and those who worship him will worship in spirit and truth. We are soul, spirit, and body. And while Judas was looking at eyes of flesh, and he says, this is a waste, Jesus says, no, this is worship. This is worship, and worship, yes, a form of worship is singing and praising, but this kind of worship, this is the Hebrew word worship that means I'm going to lay prostrate. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to throw up the, the white flag of surrender. God, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need to hear your voice because all the accusing ones coming from all over the place, I know those are not you. They're not you. I need to hear the words of a loving, affirming father. Even if those words sometimes are a little hard to hear and it's a little uncomfortable in the process of digging out shards out of your feet. And in our case, our soul. You've got to hear the voice of our father. Ephesians 6 instructs us, because you know you have an enemy, John 10, 10 tells us that, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But this is why he gives us Ephesians 6. He instructs us, put on the full armor of God, reminding us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. The shame, fear, and control cycle is a stronghold. It is a stronghold. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We have to challenge it. Is that God? Because the accusing spirit, that's not him. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's the hard work, church. That's the hard work. Every day. Nope, that's not Jesus. That is. That's not who he says I am. This is. It's every day as we put on the mind of Christ. Did you know in medieval warfare, they actually used flaming arrows? Anybody seen Braveheart? It's like <laughs> warfare with like, you know, arrows that are shooting everywhere. And they actually, you know, clearly have moved on. Uh, they're not doing that anymore. Um, but one of the major reasons is because when a, when a gust of wind comes through, it actually puts out the fire. Isn't that interesting? The spirit of God, the pneuma, is a... The wind, fresh wind, fresh fire of God. You got arrows coming? Get in the presence of the Lord. You need to talk to him. You need, the, you need the comforter. You need the Holy Spirit. You need all three persons working up in your life so you can fight the devil's schemes. I'm preaching better than y'all are amen to me. I'm just saying. Listen, a church, meaning you and me, trying to take a child's water, water pistol to a flaming arrow fight, you are not going to win. You need a fresh move of the Spirit. We cannot walk out this Christian life without the Holy Spirit's power working in our lives, church. It will render us un ineffective. Richard Foster, author of Celebration of Discipline, says it this way, singing, praying, praising, all may lead to worship, may lead to worship. That's a whole side note. Do you know it's possible to sing with your lips and not with your heart? It's another message. Go back. Jeremy did one on worship. But worship is more than any of them. Our spirit must be ignited by the divine fire of God. If we're going to walk in the things that he has called us to, church, God has put greatness on the inside of you. But we cannot do it without his help. You know, this stronghold is almost like a knot, if you can envision like a good military knot. The only way to unravel this baby is to just take it one, one strand at a time. 
You know, my necklaces get tied up all the time. For some reason, my daughter loves untangling them. I'm like, have at it. But it takes a while. You gotta be patient. And you begin to untie it and unravel. You gotta, you gotta cut the first one. We gotta cut shame. In fact, I think there is a visual that they can put up on the screen to show you what this means. And it means we're gonna have to cut the shame or we're gonna have to choose to be vulnerable. Guess what? You just cut one of the knots that is holding the stronghold in your life. The next one is you're gonna have to say, nah, I, I see a spirit of fear operating. I'm not receiving that. I'm not doing that. I'm going to see with eyes of faith. You just cut the second knot. Now it's loosened its hold. So by the time you get to the need to obsessively control something, you say, nope, 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 nope. You don't have a hold on me anymore. I choose to surrender. I choose to surrender. I want God's peace and presence in my life and in my daily decisions. Church, this is not a Sunday message. If that is all you do, you, you are taking a water pistol to a gunfight. You got to get this word in you. You need to be talking to Jesus every day. He has more for you. He has more for you. Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of water of life. Now, why this is so important, church, is Mary perceived, she, she heard Jesus. She, like, she didn't just hear him, she heard him. When he, and she takes this most precious ointment, this precious perfume that she had saved as a dowry. So valuable. And she comes and she says, I'm anointing you for burial, which is a prophetic act by faith. She sees and she, she understands this is a future state. May I submit to you, church, that we are in a day and hour, that it is no longer time to wait. We need to pour it all out. We need to lay prostrate before the Lord and give him every area of our lives. The spirit, spirit of God and the bride, that's you and me. We say, come together. Holy Spirit, do a new thing in our, in our world. Do a new thing. We need your help. You need help. You are sent on assignment into the various places that God has put you, not just for your career ladder so you can be safe and you have your safe nest egg and your 401k. Those are important. That is not why you're here. You're put on the planet to make a difference. And you cannot make that difference without the power of God, the pneuma in your life. We need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our day. Ephesians 5, 27 says the King Jesus is returning for a radiant church without spot or wrinkle. Holy and blameless, God, holy and blameless. Search us and know us, God. I don't hold anything back. Read my mail, Jesus. Read my mail. Get in my soul. Get the shards of glass that are wedged deep within the recesses of my life. None of us are excused. In closing, you have the tools to reverse engineer this thing with God's help. Come on, church, let, let's, let's, make, let's make the decision today. Shame, no longer. Fear, no longer. I'm gonna live surrendered. There's some of you in the room that you've never actually taken the first step of surrender, and that is giving your heart to Jesus, realizing that you were made on purpose for a purpose, and his name is Jesus. And Jeremy's gonna come in a minute, and I'm gonna have him lead you into that decision, and, and guess what? You're born in the family. Come on, the more the merrier. But for some of you, this is a holy moment. I fought all week for this word because I feel like, church, it's these moments that catapult you into your week, into your year, into the next decade of your life. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. This is a moment where I just wanna take a moment of surrender. Sometimes we say, oh great, your challenges are so great, Christine, I don't have time for that. And then you have good intentions, but we never do it. We're gonna do it right now. And we just surrender. What is that area? What is that area? Do you have some shame going on? I want you to give it to Jesus. Be vulnerable with him right now. Maybe fear is eating your lunch over a situation or a circumstance. Give it to him now. Surrender it. And if you even feel so led, you feel the, the spirit of God in your life talking to you, I want you to just open your palms towards heaven and say, God, I surrender all again. I surrender all again. Father, 
we thank you that you are a good, good father and that your kindness always leads to repentance. And so Jesus, we come to you and say, Jesus, please count us in. We want to be a radiant church without spot or blemish. God, we want to walk in your ways. I bind the spirit of fear and anxiety from operating. We cancel every assignment of the enemy over this house. We cancel every assignment of the enemy over our lives, family members in this room, over our city. God, and we ask you, Jesus, would you send us out like fiery darts with our hearts ablaze on fire with love for you and for other people. In Jesus' name, amen.